Hi everyone, Stepan here. It's Sunday, so we are going to continue covering Anatoly Karpov's games. Uh, we are still on, a on age 10 or age 9, which is quite possible because uh, he was either 9 on 10 or 10 in 1961. So he's still very young, still very inexperienced, but he's about to progress quickly. Okay, this game was played in his hometown of Zlatost. He played Tarinin, which is a very unknown player. And he only has two games in the database. Both of them were against Karpov. One is a win, one is a loss. And he's probably a local player. The reason why this game is interesting is it featured two critical positions which are extremely instructive. So I'm going to ask you to pause the video when we reach those two positions. One of them is very important strategically. One of them is very important tactically. Okay, it was a Chigorin closed Rui. So e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, a6, bishop a4, knight f6. This is all closed Roy Lopez mainline theory, rook e1, b5, bishop b3, d6. And now c3 played. Black castles, white plays h3, stopping bishop g4. And now black would choose between knight a5, knight b8, different moves. Karpov, the nine-year-old Karpov, plays knight a5, the Chigorin. Okay, now the idea of, of knight a5, which is going to be a huge strategic, uh, strategic feature of this game, is first you gain a tempo on the bishop, chase the bishop away to c2, which may or may not be useful because the bishop is actually good on c2, defending e4, making d4 break stronger because once the e4 pawn is removed after, let's say, e5, then you have pressure on h7. Uh, but the knight on a5 does one more thing. It frees up the c-pawn, which could advance to c5, and it does so with tempo because the bishop has to move, which makes it much harder for white to play d4. Of course, the main line of the Chigorin is still to play d4 because you have to control the center somehow, but it's not as good when there's when black has extra support on the square. Okay, queen c7, we're not going to delve too deep into theory, just wanted to explain this move, knight a5. And the idea of knight a5 is either to retreat the knight to c6, or more commonly to get it to c4. Sometimes c4 is going to be played, uh, and then the knight is going to reroute to b7 and c5. In the case of, let's say, white playing d5 here, which is not a good move, then c4 and knight b7, knight c5 is a very good idea. So this knight ca has a future, bear that in mind. Knight bd2, normal developing move, and now by far the most popular move with about 4,000 games is to exchange in the center straight away. And this is very smart, because if black doesn't exchange in the center, he's going to have less space. And the more central pawns there are, the side that has the space advantage is going to have a bigger advantage overall. So if you have a lack of space, in the center, whoever has uh, the stronger center wants to keep it, whoever has the weaker center wants to trade it off. In this case, that was black, so cd4 is a very logical move for a reason. Now you continue knight c6, the knight simply drops back, provoking something, uh, either d5 or knight b3, which is the main move. And after knight b3, you continue with a5, and, and the position goes on. As I said, a million games. After knight b2, though, Karpov played bishop to d7, which is a sideline. It's still okay. Knight f1. And here we reach the first critical position. Uh, pause the video here. This is a tough position. It's not black to play and win, black to play and lose. It's a strategic critical point in the game at which, if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know theory, you sort of need to decide on the nature of the position and one mistake could, could make your position very hard to play or very complicated. So pause the video, find a plan for black, find a move for black. Okay, there, there are normal moves here. You could play rook e8, you could play rook c8. There are good moves here, which are c takes d4, simply trading off the center. That's something you can always do in the Chigorin. It's never a mistake. So cd, cd. You can play rook ac8, putting pressure on the bishop, something like that. Okay, then also, after knight f1, a very good move is knight c4. This is actually the main theoretical move, preventing an easy knight e3. And b3 is the logical response. And now the knight drops back to b6. And this knight is actually very useful, uh, because c4 is for the moment defended against. White would love to play c4, but then bc, bc, knight c. So white has to prepare that with knight e3, but now black plays c4 himself. And this is considered to be a good position for black. You have some space on the queen side, white isn't killing you on any side of the board. So these are normal moves. 
Karpov played a dreadful move. He played knight c6. And the knight wants to drop back. Sometimes it does drop back to c6. But this is now a very provocative move which allowed white to strategically win the game straight away. Pause the video and punish knight c6. Okay, in this position, the most logical move simply works, d5. And it's not that you lose material, it's that your knight has no squares. What do you do? So you can go knight d8, knight a5, knight a7, knight b8. Neither of them is good. If you go knight d8, where can your knight go? So if you go knight d8, you don't have these two squares. You would have to play knight b7, c4, knight c5. Well, if I'm playing, playing white, I, I just play c4. And you can basically say goodbye to your knight. It's never getting into the game. Because if bc4, I simply continue knight e3. Now I'm controlling c4. I could either win this pawn with knight c4, or if you play c3, I can take bc3. It doesn't matter. The point is your knight is not getting into the game. If after d5 you, for example, play knight a5, then I could go b3, simply restraining your knight. And now after you go c4, I don't want to take bc4, isolating my c-pawn, I just go b4, and after knight b7, again, this knight is not going anywhere. Okay, then if you go knight a7, I probably just go a4, undermining your structure, so that doesn't work. And if you go knight b8, I can just go c4 again, and if you take, then knight e3. So, after knight c6, Karpov is strategically lost because his knight is a dreadful piece. And I think that's extremely instructive for all e4, e5 players, regardless of the side. Th this is something you have to bear in mind. It could also be applied to some uh, Italian positions in the two knights attack. Instead of d5, his opponent plays knight e3, which is not a bad move, because it threatens knight d5, uh, it also supports c4, sort of delays this, and now... Considering everything we said so far, Karpov, of course, should have traded off, which doesn't allow the same continuation. This would have been much better for him. Instead, he plays rook f8, which, again, you can play dc5, you can play d5, you can play knight d5, they're all good. Instead, his opponent played b3, which is a huge weakening of his position, which is completely unnecessary. Most importantly, it weakens this diagonal. If you look at the queen, the queen now has the c3 square available and something is going to get exchanged. So let me show you a way how Karpov could have punished b3 straight away, completely equalizing, probably even being better. He blundered here, but here's a good move. So c takes d4, simply trading off. Now you have two options with white, you can play knight d5 or c takes d. If you play c takes d, then knight takes d4, knight takes d4, queen c3, and you play rook b1, that's the only move, or you play bishop to d2, let's say rook b1, queen d4, or let's say queen d4, pawn d4, knight d5, takes, takes, this has to be very good for black, this is two extra pawns, and even though they're doubled, probably uh, white couldn't hold. The other option is knight d5. Knight d5 is no better. I just go queen b7, wait for you to release the tension. So cd, and knight takes d5, e takes d5, knight takes d4, knight takes d4, e takes d4, and again, a perfect position. You cannot take the spawn because you played b3. So if queen takes d4, then bishop f6 wins the rook. So b3 is positionally a suicide. It just weakens the position unnecessarily. I understand that you want to go bishop b2, but b3 is a bad move. Karpov doesn't see that, he plays bishop f8, and now finally white cashes in on his advantage, plays dc5, dc5, knight d5, and now Karpov's position is just bad. If you take the knight, which probably is the best thing to do, then you open this bishop up, and it becomes very hard to defend the king. So here we come to the tactical critical position. So Karpov took, if you don't take the knight, then you move your queen and it's, it's, I don't know what's worse, skipping the knight on d5 or opening up this diagonal towards your king. Karpov took, so e d5, Karpov played knight a5, I think knight d8 was better, defending f7, but okay. And now Mr. Tarinin plays knight g5, and this is the critical position. Okay, pause the video. You have three options. 
And you have pawn to h6, you have pawn to g6, you have pawn to f5 to defend. If you play king h8, then I can either take on h7 or on f7 with check, so that doesn't work. There is no other defense to, to the h7 pawn. So you only have three moves, h6, g6, f5. Calculate all three, which is best and why. Okay, so let's start with the worst move. Visually most appealing, what I thought was the best move when I started analyzing this was f5. This just loses on the spot. Let me show you how. White continues with queen h5. And now we're threatening h7, we're threatening f7. You have no better option than to play h6. That's the only way to defend against checkmate. Uh, and after h6, queen f7 check, king h8, and now the crushing move, pause the video, find the, the absolute killer, uh, knight e6. Knight e6 attacks the bishop, attacks the queen, if you take it your queen is hanging, also attacks g7. And in this position there are a couple of options you could go for. First of all, I was calculating the move queen d6, which seems to be the most sensible option. After queen d6, however, queen takes f5 is simply crushing. Bishop f5 also works. And now after king g8, for example, defending mate, then queen h7, uh, king f7, bishop g6. And after, for example, king d7, you can play knight takes f8, you can play bishop takes h6. In short, you're dead lost. Okay, and after knight e6, the best move, probably, to stay alive is rook takes knight and pawn takes, just giving up a bishop. That way at least you don't get mated. So let's f5. After knight g5, Karpov played h6, but first let's go through g6, which is the only move that actually defends and that doesn't lead to an immediate destruction. g6 saves the day because it defends h7. So now, for example, white cont could continue with knight e4, threatening knight f6, so black probably plays bishop to g7 and prepares f5. If you play f5 straight away, then knight f6 wins the exchange. So this would have held on. Much worse for black, but he would have held on. After h6, though, what Karpov played, the position is over. And this is going to be a great tactical exercise, I hope, uh, for all of you. So again, pause the video, you play white, punish h6. There are a couple of very interesting options. Okay, d6 was played in the game, which is not bad, but it's not good either. Let, let's have a look at some very interesting options. The best move is queen h5. And against queen h5, there's virtually no defense. If you take the knight, I mate you on h7. If you move the king, I take on f7 with check. So you have to defend f7. You have no other option. So you either move the bishop or you move the rook. So let's say rook e7. But now there's this crushing continuation. Bishop h7, check, have to go here. And now bishop e4, you've provoked the king to h8, and now you're threatening something like knight f7, because it's only defended once. After king g8, the king simply retreats back. Uh, you can just play d6. And the point has been made. d6 attacks the queen, attacks the rook, attacks the rook on a8. So there would be no other defense. And if you don't play king back to g8, then I take on f7 with check. So that's queen h5. After h6, there were other interesting options as well. Uh, I was looking at bishop h7 check straight away, but that doesn't work because I could go king h8. And now something like bishop e4, king g8, queen h5 would lead to the same variation that we saw previously. So you have to play rook e7 and then I play d6. And if you try sacrificing a ton of material with knight f7, that, that doesn't work, because king h7, something like queen d3, king g8, knight h6, and he will be able to hold with bishop g7. Okay, then also after h6, uh, there was an interesting option to just play knight f7 check straight away, which seems interesting, and it's good, and it wins, but it doesn't win as much as queen h5. So after king takes f7, there are two options here. Queen h5 would actually be a mistake, because after queen h5, king g8, if you go queen g6, I could go e4, defending this diagonal. And now if you take with the bishop, I, can si I could simply snap your bishop off and try to defend that way. So there's a more precise continuation. You play queen f3 check, and after king g8, 
you play queen e4. And now there's no e4 because you stopped the pawn. So that was very interesting. Okay, but after h6, Karpov's opponent didn't go for these moves. He played d4, d6, excuse me, straight away. Which is a pawn sacrifice. And after bishop takes d6, he just went crazy. I mean, I understand these lines are hard to find. It took me an hour to analyze a few of these variations. It's, it's complicated. So after bishop takes d6, he went bishop h7, king f8, knight f7, which is completely unnecessary. I mean, he just gave up a piece. Knight f7, queen h5 leads nowhere. King e7, black is okay. And now queen h4, and black has to be winning here. So black's position is just good so you go king f8 and he cannot attack you i was trying to make something like bishop takes h6 work but i couldn't even see a perpetual i think it's just a piece up for for black instead karpo went king e6 which is very scary uh, his opponent didn't punish that i he played queen g4 check which doesn't do anything queen g4 check you go king f6 and and you defend what he should have done and I think I made this variation work as bishop h6. Now, if you don't take it, I'm going to check you and then take on g7 and have a stronger position. So you, you take, okay, queen takes. And now after king e7, I go queen g5. I don't allow your king to run away. Now, I couldn't find mate, but I eventually found a variation which ends in f4 and you, you just crush black. So king e6 or king f7. Bishop f5, king f7. Bishop g6, a bit of repetition. Okay, I couldn't, I couldn't quite see what what to do. King e7, queen g5 check, and I thought this was a perfect position. And now rook a d1, and I don't know what black does. I was looking at knight c6, and now I continue with f4, and I think this is just devastating. I don't see a defense to this. I'm just going to take everything and and crush you. I don't. By the way, I don't even want to take this rook. So this would have been crushing. Instead, his opponent played queen g4, which doesn't do much, and then queen h4, and then king f7, and then queen h5. So he doesn't really know what to do. He gave up a piece, but he is he's not winning this position. King f8, bishop takes h6, and now Karpov lost the game, unfortunately. So it's still not tricky. This is a very simple position to defend. I mean, you just play bishop e6, which defends all the light squares, defends g7, so there's no bishop or queen takes g7, and white can resign. You, you simply have an extra knight. He has a pawn for the knight. I mean, once you play bishop f7 and bishop e7, there will be no attack. Instead, Karpov played rook e7, losing the game on the spot, and, of course... There is a fork. His opponent played it, and Karpov lost the rook. Rook f7, queen a8, and now it's of course an exchange down. Bishop c8, bishop to g5. Now white has an extra pawn, white has an exchange, white is completely dominating the position. Knight c6. The only problem is that the queen may seem like it's trapped, but after bishop e4, the queen is not trapped. Knight e7, rook a1, knight f5. Bishop takes f5, rook takes f5, rook takes d6, and in this position, Karpov resigned. Of course, if you take the rook, I take on c8 with check, and, and that's it. So, not a good game by Karpov. Uh, he made a strategic blunder, then he made a tactical blunder. But that's why we are going through this series. I'm interested in the, the development of these world champions. So... It's reassuring to know that they weren't chess geniuses when they were 9 or 10 years old. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you liked the video. Let me know what you think and stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.